of all, uh, welcome to uh, welcome to the beginning of January, which is very depressing for us academics because we've had a summer holidays come to an end in this very day. But uh, welcome to uh, the annual Grace College lecture. Grace College is the uh, aspect of this department, in a sense, aspect of the church that's responsible for candidates for the Church of Scotland ministry. And so every candidate that comes here is responsible for the Christ College. I'm a man, my name is John Swinton, I'm professor in practical theology here, but I'm also master of Christ College, uh, and you can call me master. It's good and proper. Um, every year we have this lecture, which uh, is in a variety of different subjects every year. This year is in practical theology, uh, which we're looking forward to. The idea is just to open up new space for new ideas, fresh perspectives, they can really guide us into the, the new term with some exciting new thinking, Leo. Exciting new thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to introduce you, which I'll do in a second. But once we finish uh, this lecture, you're all cordially invited for coffee and maybe uh, wine, is it? Yes, yeah, there coffee is coffee, coffee, actually. No oh, coffee. No coffee. There is wine. Oh, there you go. <laughs> In the Divinity Library, so everybody's invited to that. We spend some time together and just get the chance to get to know one another. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Leon Van Omen. Leon is the Christ College Teaching Fellow. Uh, and he's been with us for just over a year now, and he's been a great addition to the, the team. So uh, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with you over the year. And he, uh, he gives me a hard time sometimes. <coughs> Thankfully, I'm a Christian and I can forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Leo's got a fascination for liturgy, but also a fascination for, uh, for suffering. I think today he's going to bring these things together. And Leo, we really very much look forward to what you've got to bring to us. So, thank you for being here. Thank you, John, for this uh, very nice introduction. No pressure. I don't feel any pressure. Um, good afternoon, dear colleagues, students, friends. It is a real privilege for me to deliver the Divinity or Christ College opening lecture this year. And uh, before I start, I just want to express my sincere gratitude to the master for inviting me <laughs> and also to Claire Davidson um, for organizing all of this. Dear friends, I would like to take you with, with me on a tour to a painter's studio. So I hope you're all ready to do some creative mm -hmm. arts today. Let me see how this works. It works. So we're in the painter's studio. Don't worry, there are enough easels and stools and paint brushes and paint. There is more than enough for everyone. And the assignment that we have been given for today is to paint a portrait from the perspective of liturgy, a portrait of suffering. Liturgy and suffering. Now suffering, what is that? Let's enter the studio and turn on the radio. We turn on the radio and immediately we hear the, the, the news about the terrorist attacks in Cambrils and, and Barcelona. And we can only imagine the fear that is involved with that. In our mind's eye we see people running across the street we see the angst, we see the anxiety. Parents worrying over their children, children worrying over their parents. The sleepless nights in the wake of the events. We switch off the radio, we look out of the window, and we look into the street and we see people passing by and there is this man with a sad face. <coughs> what is behind that sad face? It can be anything. Maybe there is some major depression. Maybe his partner just left him. Maybe he mourns the death of his son. There's all kinds of suffering. Let's close the window and just for a brief moment switch on the television and we see the pictures of the mudslides in Sierra Leone, in Yemen, in India. We hear the report or, or just we hear the words of, of a woman who lost 17 of her family members. And she says, I don't have tears anymore. 
This part of our assignment today, the suffering, is maybe the hardest part, but on the other hand, it's not difficult to imagine, is it? And add to that just your own suffering or the suffering in the, in, in the lives of, of your loved ones. It is not so hard to imagine. But then we have, of course, that other word, liturgy. Now, in the 10 years or so that I'm studying liturgy, there's one thing that has become very clear to me. And that is that the word liturgy means different things to different people. So maybe if you're an evangelical, you think the word liturgy or the concept or even liturgy itself is something best to avoid or even just to bin it. You might be a Roman Catholic and you think of the liturgy as the Eucharist or the daily office, the morning prayer, evening prayer, that structure that facilitates worship. You might be Church of Scotland. I don't know what you think about liturgy then. Maybe you think, well, the best thing about liturgy is to get rid of all the smells and bells of the Roman Catholics. Might be. Or you're a Pentecostal and you think, we don't have liturgy. Talk to me afterwards, please. <laughs> you may be from a completely different tradition and have different connotations with the word liturgy. That's fine. And then there are just some, just some I know, who simply love it. And I'm one of them. Liturgy, what is it? I think a good working definition that I came across is that liturgy is the structure that facilitates worship. Right? And that word structure can mean all kinds of things. You can think of the assembly of the Christian community, typically on a Sunday morning, and the structure of that worship service. You can think of the structure of daily offices, the morning prayer, the evening prayer, in a monastic office even more prayers, morning prayer here in chapel starting on Wednesday, this was my little advertisement. <laughs> you may think of the liturgical year, the whole structure from Advent all the way across over Pentecost and um, Easter, Pentecost, and then ending with Christ the King, Sunday of Christ the King. It's a structure, and all that that structure tries to do is to facilitate worship. Now, you will hear me using the words liturgy and worship a little bit interchangeably sometimes in this lecture. My point is not to give clear-cut uh, clear definitions today, um, so maybe you want to fill in the word worship sometimes when I use liturgy. That's perfectly fine with me. I think of it primarily in terms today, primarily in terms of that which the Christian communities do typically on a Sunday morning. That's how I will primarily use that term liturgy today. Good. And I will focus on the Scottish liturgy uh, for a couple of reasons. The Scottish liturgy contains a lot of ancient prayers. Prayers that have been prayed throughout the Christian history. And I think there is a certain richness to that. So by focusing on a traditional liturgy, we place ourselves in that line of the Christian tradition. Uh, tradition. Um, it's also, it also happens to be the, the liturgy that I'm most familiar with, and it's very similar to the liturgy of the Church of England's common worship, which I analyzed for my PhD a couple of years ago. So I can talk most easily and comfortably from that liturgy, and I think that is not a bad idea. Um, before you think, well, the Scottish liturgy, that is just far removed from anywhere where I am, it is remarkable that as soon as you start to compare liturgies, you will see that many liturgical traditions are very similar. There are some basic patterns. And almost all liturgies, including that of the evangelicals, and there I see that, say the Pentecostals, have that fourfold structure of gathering the word and then the sacrament or an alternative response to the word and the sending. And that is similar throughout almost all liturgies. We'll come back to that later. So I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready to get out your paint brushes and your paint, get behind your easel and paint in your mind's eye a portrait of suffering. And I will give, do so also by focusing on the Scottish liturgy. So let's start by drawing some contours. And what I mean is, let's start analyzing the liturgy. Good. So, First of all, again, there is this pattern, the fourfold pattern of gathering the word, the Eucharist, and the sending. Now, I will be using that throughout this lecture. 
Just to give you an example of some similarities and dissimilarities between various liturgical traditions, let me quickly say a few things here. So in the first column you see the Scottish liturgy of the Scottish Episcopal Church. Then second column, Church of Scotland, first order for Holy Communion. Then the third column, uh, Church of Scotland without Holy Communion, and then an Evangelical Church. This is the liturgy of an Evangelical Church that I analyzed a couple of years ago in Belgium. Um, there is a little bit more um, variety in Evangelical liturgies. But for now, this will do, I think, as an example. So we start with the entrance. So the ministers come in. I grew up in a Reformed tradition, it was all black and white, and we used to joke that the penguins came in, and that was the moment that you need to be silent. And I was silenced by my father as soon as I used the word penguins. Um, <laughs> believe me. So we start with the entrance, the procession in a more traditional um, Anglican or Roman Catholic church. You have to welcome, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or grace and mercy be to you, from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a call to worship or a personal welcome in the evangelical church. We might sing a hymn, uh, there might be some scripture sentences, and then there is a quite lengthy rite of confession with a short absolution. It always strikes me that absolution is so short compared to the lengthy confession. Anyways, um, you do with that whatever you like. But if you, if you start to compare this, this is not so dissimilar. And the Church of Scotland and the Scottish Episcopal Church have pretty similar prayers and rites here. Evangelicals, in my experience, don't do confession of sin, usually. There might be some churches who do. In my experience, most don't. But there might be a song. And then we have the Gloria and the Collect. The Collect is, for those who don't know what a Collect is, it's the prayer of the day. Right? It's, it's, the, it's the prayer usually written in relation to the scripture readings for that Sunday. Good. So you see the similarities. Now, now that we've looked a little bit more closely at the gathering, I would like to make a couple of observations from the gathering, which, which kind of sets the tone for our painting. We gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that does something. It is a transition into a different story. We come through, uh, out of the stories of our daily lives and through that transition, we are entering another story in narrative terms. It is, it is not, it's not unlike a fairy tale who starts always with, once upon a time, there was this beautiful princess in a country far away. However, she had a mother who was wicked, right? And so we have the confession of sin. In narrative terms, there is a similarity here. So you, you, you're transposed almost into a different story. But like in the fairy tale, there is a problem. It is as if the liturgy structurally, what liturgy does here is saying, yes, you are welcome in that other story. You gather in that name of the Trinity. And nevertheless, before we go any further, there is something that is wrong and that needs to be rightened. And therefore you have the confession of sin. And then the absolution. And after the absolution, you can go on. That's why you should never have a confession of sin without absolution, in my opinion. Now, this is the gathering and um, you might think, well, that's a rather bleak picture. And it is. It is. We start with confession of sin. Something is wrong. So the background colors in our paintings might be quite dark, actually. It's interesting, though, that there is a movement in the liturgy. And this is even supported historically by the layout of a church building. Maybe you've noticed that churches historically were built from west to east. You see that in some churches, St. Nicholas Kirk, for example, in the, in the city center, it's from west to east. And you enter through the west, and symbolically, the West is that place of darkness. It's that place of sinfulness, of fallenness, right? So we, we come from that world of darkness, but we enter into the church, and there the liturgy goes on. And so, maybe first, when, you, when we gather through the Western Gate over there, in traditional churches, in Roman Catholic Church, you see still a little basket with water. What, does, what is that? 
It's blessed water and you dip your finger and you cross yourself and it's the water of a baptism. You're reminded again by this very structure, even architecturally, that you're entering this other story, right? And so the liturgy moves on and the service of the word <laughs> takes place here in this area, right? There we have the readings, the sermon, Nicene Creed, or not a creed. And then the liturgy moves on with the Eucharist. We go up there and there's the sending. So you see there is a movement in the liturgy from west to east, from darkness to light. And as we process through the liturgy or progress through the liturgy, we are looking to the east through that massive stained glass window. And on a Sunday morning, there is a beautiful eastern light coming up, shining through the window symbolizing the light of Christ. So there is this movement towards the light, from the dark place to the light. Okay, good. We should move on and let's do some analysis of suffering in the liturgy. Where and how is suffering mentioned in the liturgy? Let's take a walk through the Scottish liturgy here. We start with the gathering. I'm going to stand here again if that's all right with you. I can better see the screen. So we have the entrance and all we are going to do now is just take a tour through the liturgy and tick the boxes where we see suffering mentioned, okay? Just that kind of observation, just that kind of analysis. And so there's the entrance, there is the welcome and the words of welcome may include some words related to suffering, but maybe they are not, we don't know. Um, and you see that I've, I've put in two columns, there's the suffering of the people but also the suffering of Christ. And this will turn out to be important in our analysis, in our portrait that we are painting. Uh, there is the collect for purity. Um, so this is an ancient prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, etc., etc. This is the introduction to the confession of sin. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts. Apparently it's a messy place inside. Cleanse it need some tidying up there. And so we have the summary of the law and then the confession and the absolution. Now, in the Scottish liturgy, it, the confession is proper, is introduced like, God is love and we are his children. There is no room for fear in love. Now, fear might denote some suffering, but actually it's so much in the context of sin that I hesitate to really put the X very strongly, but maybe. But there is also the petition to deliver us from the power of evil. So again, Maybe some suffering is involved here. Would you agree? But then, forgive us our sins and deliver us from the power of evil for the sake of your son who died for us. Now, there's clearly the suffering of Christ. So that's firm X there. We continue with the Kyrie. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Well, is there suffering? Not very explicitly, but why would you ask for mercy if there is not something to ask mercy for? So maybe, again, there is some suffering. And then we burst out with the Gloria. And interestingly, in the midst of that hymn of praise, again, there is, Lord, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. So the Lamb of God denotes the sacrifice of God, of course. So there is some suffering involved. And then we have the collect, the prayer of this particular Sunday. I haven't analyzed it, uh, all the collects, but I assume that there is not a lot of suffering mentioned in the collects. Usually it's not, I think. Good. Let's move on. We have had the gathering, right? And now we go to the liturgy of the word. We have the readings, we have the sermon, and again, suffering may be addressed, may not be addressed, we don't know. Then there is the Nicene Creed, and there is cer certainly the suffering of Christ is addressed again. For our sake, he was crucified on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, right? The suffering of Christ. And then we move on with the intercessions. Now this is interesting. The intercessions are not written out here, in this liturgy at least. Church of Scotland has a couple of intercessions in, in the form itself. The Anglicans have separate books for that, or separate uh, parts. But here is only the rubrics. The rubrics in a liturgical textbook are the guidelines, right? It's the guidelines. And it says, prayer is offered for the world and its people, for those who suffer and those in need, for the church and its members. So here, clearly, human suffering, those events in Barcelona, in Sierra Leone, those events in your lives, might be addressed here, should be addressed here. And we close this part of the liturgy by sharing the peace, which 
is the transition into the liturgy of the sacrament, the Eucharist. In a traditional liturgy, you have the Eucharistic celebration here. Okay, again, let's do the exercise. Here's the offering. The language of offering might denote sacrifice, but it's not very clearly suffering. But nevertheless, let's, let's just note it here with a question mark. In the Eucharistic prayer, we have the same language. We offer ourselves with Christ. What does that mean? Maybe some suffering. But in the Eucharistic prayer, that's a lengthy prayer, there is clearly the suffering of Christ. Let me just give you some examples. Obedient to your will, he died upon the cross. By your power, you raised him from the dead. He broke the bonds of evil and set your people free to be his body in the world. And again, in the narratives of institution, he broke the bread, he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And after supper, he took the cup, he offered you thanks, gave it to them, and saying, Drink this, all of you. It is poured out for you and for all, that sins may be forgiven. So clearly Christ's suffering is addressed, or is present in the Eucharistic prayer. We move on with the breaking of the bread. Um, the living bread broken for the life of the world. Lord, unite us in his sign. Again, the brokenness of Christ. We move on with the Lord's Prayer. And we have this petition, but deliver us from evil. Again, evil might denote suffering. So there is some suffering there, perhaps. And then we have the communion. So the priest or another servant will hand out the bread to you. And what does he or she say? The body of Christ broken for you. There is suffering. And likewise with the cup, the blood of Christ shed for you. So there is suffering. And we continue with the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Okay. And then we finally have the sending, the last part, a brief part of the liturgy. There might be a scripture sentence. Um, and then the post-communion prayer again takes up Christ's suffering, who died for us, so we might have new life. Father, we have broken the bread which is Christ's body. We have tasted the wine of his new life in one uh, post-communion prayer. We might sing a hymn. At other occasions, we might sing hymns. And again, suffering might be addressed, might not be addressed. A blessing and a dismissal. Okay, so far for the tour through the liturgy. Are you still with me? Okay, good. So if we just sum this up, then we see that the liturgy addresses human suffering explicitly in the intercessions. But that is about the only bit. Maybe the Lord's Prayer, but deliver us from evil. But not a lot more. Right? It may be addressed in the words of welcome, in the hymns, in the readings, in the sermon. And it's interesting, just by the way, it's interesting that here is an important role for the liturgical minister. So if you want to address human suffering, it is very well possible, but it, it demands some, some liturgical creativity. Right? You need to think about it, what you do with those moments, that the liturgy just leaves up to you, basically. Okay? So a very important role for the minister here. I think there is a huge responsibility in leading worship. Suffering, human suffering is implicitly addressed in the Kyrie Eleison, the Lord have mercy. And then very interestingly, if you analyze the liturgy, there is all this talk about a new life and a new birth, new creation. Set your people free. So, Implicitly, there might be some suffering going on, because otherwise we shouldn't be liberated, should we? Okay? We've noted the sacrificial language of offering ourselves, and it's, it's really remarkable how much the liturgy focuses on sin. And we need to raise that question, what's the relationship between sin and suffering? And I'm not saying we're going to answer it all today, but at least we should flag the issue here, right? Okay, let's go to the suffering of Christ. It's remarkable, again, the suffering of Christ, we had some firm access there, right? And throughout the liturgy. In the gathering, in the rite of confession. In the Nicene Creed, which is in the liturgy of the Word. In the Eucharistic rite, which is the liturgy of the sacrament. In the post-communion prayer, which in the Scottish liturgy is in the sending part. In the Church of England, that is still within the Eucharistic rite, but it's clearly the post-communion prayers are clearly sending prayers. So I think the Scottish liturgy does something right here, actually. 
Um, and again, like human suffering, the suffering of Christ might be addressed in the readings, in the sermon, in hymns, etc. Good. So we've sketched the contours of our liturgical portrait, right? We have seen a fourfold structure that gives kind of a structure to our painting. We are drawn into that other story in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which is very different from in the name of the worship leader. And I'm so glad that you are here. You know, it rains so hard and yet you all made it. That's so great. It's a very different opening from in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It draws you into a different story. And then there's the human suffering and Christ's suffering. We've looked at that. Those are the contours. That, in other words, that is our analysis so far, our observations from the liturgical text. Okay. Time to add some color. In other words, how should we interpret all of this? Good. If the suffering of Christ is more dominant in the liturgy than the suffering of human beings, perhaps this should be our starting place for the interpretation of suffering in liturgy from a liturgical perspective. So let's start there with the suffering of Christ. First of all, the suffering of Christ is related very clearly to sin. Let me give you a couple of examples. Forgive us our sins for the sake of your Son who died for us in the rite of confession. Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world in the Gloria, the hymn of praise, and also in the Eucharistic prayer. The Arius Dei, sorry. And then in the Eucharistic prayer, this is my blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for all that sins may be forgiven. So there is a clear relationship between Christ's suffering and human sinfulness. The other thing that strike, strikes us if, if when, when, we, when we read the, the liturgical text is that suffering of Christ is related to evil. A couple of times is there, at least three times in the liturgy, is that petition, deliver us from evil. Forgive us our sins and deliver us from the power of evil for the sake of your son who died for us. Again, this is the rite of confession, the prayer of confession. And then he broke the bonds of evil in the Eucharistic prayer and in the Lord's prayer, but deliver us from evil. So, Christ's suffering is related to sin and to evil. That's the kind of the background of Christ's suffering. Those are the background colors. Rather bleak again, right? It's a rather dark picture that we get. But the really exciting thing of this analysis, when you do it for yourself, I, I really advise you to do that and just, just go through the liturgy in this way. It's just very rewarding. I, I, again, I like this kind of stuff, okay? Um, but what is really remarkable is that these are only the background colors. When you start analyzing all those instances of Christ's suffering, they're all clearly related to some kind of purpose, for lack of a better word. There is, there is a movement in the liturgy, there is an energy in the liturgy. Look at this. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. This is the Collect for Purity again. Now this is not yet clearly related to Christ's suffering, but in the whole of the liturgy you will see that it is. Okay, so that's why I cast my net a little bit wider here. Um, but it's it is related to Christ's suffering. If you read the absolution, I'm just going to read it for you, so you, have to, so you know that I'm not just making up something here. The absolution speaks of forgiveness, but also strengthening and healing. God, who is both power and love, forgive us and free us from our sins, Heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. So yes, there is forgiveness of sins. But it's not just, you know, you did something wrong and now it's all right again. There is, there's this language of healing, of strengthening, of new life even. In the Nicene Creed, for us and our salvation, for our sake, Jesus suffered. Christ made his home among us that we might forever dwell in you. In the Eucharistic prayer. The Father calls us to new birth and creation restored by love. This is all from the Eucharistic prayer now. As children of your redeeming purpose, we offer you our praise with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven. There is the goal of the worship and then the congregation bursts out with that company of heaven in the holy, holy, holy Lord, God of glory and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Right? Christ brings wholeness to all that is made. He broke the bonds of evil and set your people free to be his body in the world. And the people pray that we may be kindled with the fire of your love and renewed for the service of your kingdom. 
etc., etc. I could put up one or two more slides here. So you see that even though we have those background colors, I have many more quotations of that kind of energy that is there in the liturgy. As I said, you move from west to east, you move out of the dark place towards the light. Okay, that's what the liturgy does. In sum, the purpose of Christ's suffering is the reconciliation between God and people in order for the people to worship God and to be set free to live a new life. That's my kind of summary of how I interpret, how I read all those instances. And this new life is sometimes pictured as eschatological, but even more often as serving the kingdom of God as Christ's body on earth, here and now. That's the kind of the purpose of Christ's suffering. But what about human suffering? We've seen human suffering is addressed in the intercessions, maybe the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> That's not an awful lot. And we might come to the conclusion that liturgy is just not so interested in human suffering. Well, maybe, on the other hand, it does have a place for it. And a minister can be liturgically creative to make even more space for that kind of lament over the suffering. So that's not all there is to say. And it's interesting that Christ's suffering is actually preceded at least twice in the liturgy by the Incarnation, right? So in the Nicene Creed, for us and for our salvation, he became man. Let me find it here. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. And then it follows, for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. So the incarnation, Jesus suffered as a human being. So it just doesn't fly to make a too sharp distinction between human suffering and Christ's suffering because Christ suffered as a human being. So what does that say? God identified, and sorry, the second part is in the Eucharistic prayer. So glory and thank, thanksgiving be to you, most loving Father, for the gift of your Son, born in human flesh. Then obedient to your will, he died upon the cross. Right? So God identifies with human beings through the incarnation, which clearly includes suffering. So, perhaps the liturgy is suggesting that we should reinterpret human suffering in light of Christ's suffering. The liturgy kind of reframes human suffering. So what does it say? Again, the dark background colors are suffering uh, of suffering are sin and, and, and evil. We've seen that. And the bright colors of the purpose, again, for lack of a better word, I don't like the word purpose here really, but I don't know a better word for that right now. Forgiveness, liberation, healing, new life. So the implication of that is that the human condition is one which is diminished, right? You don't need to be liberated if you're not somehow imprisoned. You don't need healing if you're not ill or suffering. So the human condition is one of diminishment. So the liturgy's interpretation of human suffering, I suggest, is that human suffering is first of all the alienation from God. It's an alienation from worship. It's an alienation from life as it was meant to be. This is a kind of the reframing of human suffering by the liturgy. Let me put it differently. Because you might think there is no place then for the stories of Barcelona, of Sierra Leone, other stories of suffering. Well, there is in the liturgy, as we have already seen. But how should we make sense of this? Just, just let step, uh, step back. Why on earth do Christian people gather on a Sunday and go to church? And why on earth does Jesus say where there are two or three gathered in my name, I will be there in their midst? It is because they desire a relationship. The liturgy, worship, is first of all a relationship. And as we have seen, you can't continue with that relationship without a confession of sin. The structure of the liturgy makes that very clear. 
So the relationship is broken, and so the, the whole design of the liturgy is to mend that broken relationship. It's for healing and reconciliation. And so the liturgy is dynamic, again, for lack of a better word, what happens in that liturgy is actually the melting together of the stories of God and the stories of the people. There is a vision of new life. If you read that liturgy, there is that vision of, of the new birth and new creation, and the worship of God and all the rest of it. There is a grand vision in that story of God that we have entered through that beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right? And within that grander story, there is still a place for human suffering. But the emphasis is on Christ's suffering as a necessity to make that grand story happen and possible. Suffering is, of Christ is actually that through which we have hope. And so we move again from suffering to hope, to new life. Now, let me say a few words and let me check on the timing. We have time. Let me say a few words on this language of sacrifice because we haven't, we, we have noticed that there is this sacrificial language. What should we do with this? Christ's sacrifice, um, that's clear in the liturgy. Christ is painted as the Lamb of God, right? The sacrifice, He died for us for our sake, for the forgiveness of sin, for healing, for strengthening, all the rest of it. We've seen that. The language of sacrifice is also mentioned in relation to human beings, at least twice in the liturgy. And here are these occasions. This is from the Eucharistic prayer. We now obey your son's command. We recall his blessed passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension. And we look for the coming of his kingdom. Made one with him, we offer you these gifts and with them ourselves. And with these gifts, that's the bread and the wine. And with these gifts, we offer ourselves a single holy living sacrifice. And we are reminded, of course, of the Apostle Paul who writes in Romans 12, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice and be transformed by transformation of your mind, of your thinking. And if you read Romans 12, then it's clear that you're drawn into another story again. And you live life in a community in a different way. By being made one with him, with Christ, we are drawn not only in another story, but into a different pattern. A pattern where there is life after suffering, through suffering, because of the suffering of Christ. It's a pattern where blessed are you if you are persecuted. What does that say about sacrifice? It's a pattern where we forgive enemies. It's a strange pattern, really. And we offer ourselves as a sacrifice. We are willing to be part of that strange pattern in the liturgy. The second time that the sacrificial language of human beings is used is in the, um, in the post-communion prayer. May we, let me find it here. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. So again, there is this oneness with Christ by which we take part in that pattern. And so we share Christ's body, the broken body, for the life of the world. And we drink his cup bringing life to others. And that cup reminds us of a couple of stories in Scripture. We are reminded of that mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John who asked Jesus, you know, Jesus, in your kingdom, would it be possible that James and John sit both at, you know, one of your hands there, at one of your sides? And Jesus, I think quite wisely, just kind of avoids that question and says, well, I, that's not up to me. Sensible answer. But then he turns to the disciples, to James and John, and he says, can you drink this cup? And they say, yes, we can. And Jesus says, well, you will. Now, what kind of cup is that? Flash forward in the gospel. The Garden of Gethsemane. And we see Jesus there, praying to the Father, please let this cup be taken away from me. It is a cup of suffering. Right? 
And Jesus, even Jesus himself, doesn't want to drink the cup. If it is possible, Father, please take it away from me. Third instance of the cup that we are reminded, of course, is the Last Supper. When Jesus, and we have read the words from the narrative institution, um, the institution narrative, sorry. This is my cup of the new covenant. This is my blood poured out for you. Again, there is the suffering in that cup. So again, human beings are taken up in the pattern of Christ and with Christ being made one with him, there is some suffering. Somehow, Christ's suffering is related to human suffering as we saw through the incarnation. But here, the post-communion prayer also relates human suffering to Christ's suffering. So we are taken up in that pattern, a pattern of new life which comes from sacrificing ourselves. That strange pattern of Christ, where death leads to life. And that's very much contra a culture that tries to push suffering away. Which is, I think, a dominant mark of our Western society, at least. We don't like suffering. We push it away. And so, just as a question to take with you. I, I was meant to raise some questions, John, wasn't I? All right. Good. How do you think about that? If you are one with Christ, if that's the Christian vocation, then it involves suffering. How does that reframe how we think in the West about suffering? Because I have a, little, a couple of minutes left, I saw. Let me tell you a story quickly. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference, a liturgical conference, and I met there with a friend. And she is one of the very few practical theologians in the Middle East, or at least teaching in a seminary. And their seminary, um, I don't remember exactly which countries, but they serve about six countries. And all of these countries in the Middle East, Christians are persecuted. And I was talking about this lecture with her, and I said, well, you know, suffering, and there can't be goodness in suffering, and all the rest of it. And she says, well, you should come to us, because in our lives, suffering is daily reality. Persecution is daily reality, and we rejoice in it. And that struck me. Suffering for Christ is something to rejoice in. And of course that is much more biblical than our Western perspective. So I just leave that with you here. Just to think about what do we think about suffering and what does it mean that we are one with Christ? So we've been painting, folks. I hope you have been painting as well from the background of your own liturgies, your own worship experiences, your own experiences of suffering. And the liturgical portrait, how does it look like? If we take a step back, what do we see? Do we see the dark background colors of sin and evil? Well, they are certainly there in the liturgy. That's something else that we need to think about in the West. I've noticed, and maybe that's just my generation, but we don't like to speak about sin. Welcome to the liturgy. And nevertheless, this is not my picture. It's not dark. Because as we have seen, the energy of the liturgy is for life, for new life, for new birth. There is where the energy goes. There is what the, that's the direction of the liturgy. And so mine is a rather bright picture. Suppose that someone came into our painter's studio. What would he see? What are the eye catchers? I think, well, <laughs> first of all, Human suffering is not absent, but it's not dominant either. So that's actually a non-eye catcher, you could say. Human suffering, in, in the sense of, of Barcelona, the terrorist attacks, in the sense of all the angst and anxiety, is not the dominant discourse of the liturgy. Rather, it's the suffering of Christ that is emphasized. Against the background colors, the dark background colors of a diminished world, because of evil and sin. But we've seen that the picture is actually a bright picture. The colors of hope for a new life. And a new life in a liturgy is characterized by serving God in the kingdom. The kingdom of God. And by glorifying, worshipping God. And what is remarkable throughout the liturgy, and especially in the Eucharist, is this unity between God and the people. I often think that taking communion is the most intimate relationship that you can have with Christ. You smell it, you taste it, you, you, you touch it. 
You hear the words. You see it. All the senses are involved in the, intimate, in the intimacy. And so there is this unity between God and the people. And I think that the Scottish liturgy has this one beautiful prayer here. In Christ your Son, our life and yours are brought together in a wonderful exchange. He made his home among us that we might dwell forever in you. You see that a kind of intertwining of, of Jesus, the incarnation, and, the, and then that we might dwell in you. Through your Holy Spirit, you call us to new birth in a creation restored by love. That's where the energy goes, folks. That is the pain. That is part of the picture. That's an eye catcher. And that unity with Christ does include suffering. But even more so, transformation. So, we've been painting our picture. A picture of suffering, and even more so, a picture of hope. Hopefully. And I've, I hope that you will see that <coughs> there is life after brokenness. There is the brokenness, but then there is the life. Let me close with a couple of remarks. First of all, as becomes clear from the story of my friend in the Middle East, this picture that we've been painting today is just part of it. It's not the whole museum. It's only one picture. Maybe together we have an even more richer picture, but then still we are in one room. We need to go to other painters' studios, in other cultures. How do they paint? Rembrandt and Van Gogh were both masters, and yet their paintings were very different. Right? We need to look at other cultures, other perspectives, if we want to get a fuller picture of suffering in liturgy and suffering in hope. And one final comment. I have painted the picture quite linear. Right? From west to east, from death to life, from suffering to hope. But we all know that life is not so neat and not so linear. And so maybe we should more think about it in circular terms. I don't know exactly how to do it. Again, this is just the first lecture, so we should have a whole course in this, don't you think? <laughs> but think about it in circular. And, and the liturgy already gives a hint. Because we have seen that the sending, I painted that in the east. But there is no door in the east. There is no door in the east. You are sent out through the west again. So you have come from that dark and fallen place and you are being sent out into that same place again. Into that messy, chaotic place where the suffering is really present in our world. But. We've been transformed in the liturgy. We have seen a different story. Our stories have been taken up in that grand vision of God's story with people. And so we are sent out, but differently. And with that, it just rests me to, leaves me to wish you a wonderful academic year. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions, comments, water. <laughs> Lina, please. Thank you for a very challenging and stimulating paper. And when I read this order, I can't help but being struck by the fact that the majority of the songs are songs of lament rather than songs of praise. And when I look at literature, I see again this absence of lament. An event is, in a sense, people's voice when they express their suffering. Could you comment on the what I perceive to be the lack of lament in the community? Thank you for that question. Um, as I said, we need a whole course, maybe a whole program, really. <laughs> um, th this is one of my interest indeed in, in studying suffering and liturgy and it's remarkable you're just right lament is is mainly absent from western liturgies now just to go back to this friend in the middle east very interesting she she uh, gave the example of one of the liturgies in one of the countries and i really don't remember which one it was where before they start the eucharistic prayer so that that that, that third part of the liturgy they have um a litany remembering the martyrs and the confessors. And she said, and it really struck me, 
She said, we begin somewhere in, in, in the early centuries of Christianity. But it's always a flood of tears because we continue until last week. Right? And so, in different cultures, that's why we need to go to different cultures. And, and, and I would be quite keen, actually, to, to do that kind of, of, of research program and, and to involve people from other cultures to, to see how they lament. Because in other cultures, they do. But it's, it's right, you are absolutely right. A couple of years ago, or maybe 20 years ago by now, I think, there's, there's an article written by Lester Meyer, and it's called something like The Lack of Lament in Our Churches, or something like that. And he analyzes a couple of lectionaries, and the conclusion is that lament psalms, and also books like Job, Lamentations, etc., etc., they're systematically taken out of the lectionaries, proportionally, right? Um, Think about this wonderful phrase from Lamentations 3, verse 21, I think. His mercies are new every morning. Just read the preceding 20 verses and the preceding chapters and the chapters afterwards. It's one of the very few verses of hope in the book of Lamentations. Nevertheless, that's what people tend to know, if they know scripture at all. That's the verse that they will know, and not the other verses, often. Not always. And so, you're right, there's a lack of lament in the churches. The lectionary will not necessarily restore that, depending on which lectionary. Again, if you do the daily offices, for example, if you right? Use the Psalms. If you use the Psalms, but then the, the point with the lectionaries is that they take out many Psalms, and what do they take out proportionally? The Psalms of Lament. That's the whole point. So you need to have a lectionary that includes all of the Psalms, and those are only few. You get them in the daily offices, in the monastic offices, right? Usually, in a monastic office, the psalms are prayed within one month. So, Lena, I wish I had a solution, but I don't. But that's what I devoted my attention to for 10 years. So, um, there is a book published. <laughs> <laughs> but continue to lament, and, and we need to do something about it. And the other thing that I want to comment in this regard is that if you look at modern hymn writing um, and song writing, I include Hillsong and all the rest of it, there are more and more songs of lament. And especially after 9-11, people realized that there is a lack of songs of lament. But what strikes me, if you compare these songs, not all of them, but the majority, I would say, that at least I know of, the majority of these songs do not elaborate on the suffering but jump to the hope very quickly. If you compare that to the Psalms of Lament, half of the Psalm will lament and say how bad it is before, but I will trust in you, right? And so there's a lot of work to do. And if there are any singer-songwriters here among us, I urge you to write songs of lament that don't jump too quickly to the hope. This is just a question, really, because you mentioned daily offices, and I was thinking on that line. I um, don't know enough about things like matins and vespers, even though I come from an orthodox background, but I'm trying to figure out, is it perhaps partly because of this sort of almost distorting emphasis on just Sunday worship, which is a result more of the times than keeping up all the other parts, which would have given a whole package of what's going on in the church, because yes, you need through all that then to emphasis in a very great glory and worship way, the resurrection and the Sunday service, but you would have got everything else that yep. builds up to it as well. Yeah. Um, that might be part of the explanation. Um, and there's certainly something to say to restore the daily offices much more. In the Church of England, they have done quite some effort by restoring morning prayer and evening prayer much more and rethinking that. Um, we do morning prayer here, as you know. <laughs> so, you know, there is some movement there. Um, what is certainly true when you study liturgy, um, if, you, if you remember my working definition, liturgy is the structure that facilitates worship. And I said that structure can be the Sunday morning worship, it can also be the daily office and a whole liturgical year. And if you take all of that together, you get a much, much richer picture. And of course, and again, this is only one lecture focusing on that Sunday worship, which is definitely not the only thing. And even 
the liturgical text that I analyzed, you should complement that with the seasonal prayers and the seasonal prefaces for the Eucharist and all the rest of it. And taken together, you get a much more richer picture. Absolutely. Nevertheless, I would argue, but I wouldn't do, need to do the analysis, but I would argue that the picture as I have painted here will largely remain the same. <laughs> Many questions, that's good. Thank you, very good. Um, helpful to me, not familiar with Church of Scotland uh, liturgy, and I appreciate that. My question is, maybe my context of my question is more for the responsibility of the minister to really connect all that um, is in the richness of the liturgy with this, this human supper shows up on Sunday morning. The, uh, and I know there's, there's, we can't expect too much on a Sunday morning experience to fix human suffering, but at least connect with it. And if, if you, if, you know, if admittedly we have a significant decline in the Church of Scotland and um, no decline in suffering. And so there's, there's something, you know, there's a real um, miss there somehow. And, um, and I wonder if, if you view um, the liturgy as um, in need of, you know, something. And I don't know what that is. It's not my tradition. But I also would say about the um, the chart that was up there at the beginning of the four, even Delta over on the other side. I'm, I'm over there somewhere. Um, and so my question, you know, fits that. When, when you present that as song, 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 um, makes me chuckle a little bit because there's so much more going on in, um, in that. If, if the worship leader has any clue, it's not just a song service. There's a a real movement from praise, starting with God's greatness, not our sin, um, and then moving toward brokenness and lament through modern day hymn type um, things. But then the, the use of the testimony in the church service, the longer sermon that um, is heavy on the word and but felt need oriented. And I know being relevant is you know cheap, you know. Uh, but then ending with ministry time, um, and I'm wondering if if you know there's any bridge between these worlds. Because I don't think it's okay to God that um, we're missing the suffering around us on Sunday morning. Yeah. Um, but anyway, those are my, my random thoughts. Here's the fix. <laughs> Good thoughts, definitely. Um, again, we need a whole course to explore these kind of issues. And uh, there's certainly something to say to you. What kind of liturgies do we have? How do they connect to people? Um, in the Sunday morning worship is not going to fix all there is. Of course not. N nevertheless, what fascinates me about liturgy, and the Sunday liturgy in particular, it's the kind of the heart of the Christian community's worship of God. And that's the kind of the heart of, of the Christian community, therefore. And therefore, it's somehow the heart of theology, I think. Of course, I say that as a liturgist, <laughs> right? But we need to, to, to focus on that somehow. If you're a Christian, it's quite likely you go to church on a Sunday. So what do we do with that? And of course, it's not the only thing. I realize that very well. Um, and there are different types of liturgy, and, and we need to think all of, about all of that. But yeah, we need a much longer discussion, I think, to, to explore all of that. Thank you for your thoughts. Yeah. Well, the uh, longer discussion can be over a glass of orange juice or wine or no coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's the man. Exactly. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for a wonderful presentation, but also for your gracious responses, and you've given us even more to think about afterwards. So we're very grateful to you.